right. So my name is Madison Scrabeck, and um, I uh, am a doctoral candidate currently at the University of Southampton, and this is my MA thesis. And so let's just get straight into it. So what are the Saxon shore forts, first and foremost? So the Saxon shore forts are um, nine coastal fortifications outlined in the Notitia Dignitatum, which is a fourth century um, a fourth century document. However, the um, oh, this is fallen already. Um, the earliest version that survives is actually a 15th century document by Perenay Lamy. So the accuracy of this document is called into question. Um, and so these nine heavy stone fortifications have been attributed with varying certainty to 11 different um, Roman fortifications found along the southern coast of Britain um, that are all built between 225 CE and 290 CE. Um, there's some debate on the attribution of Garanonum and Porta Saderni to different sites. However, for the purposes of my spatial analysis, I um, use I used and modeled all eleven possible rather than choosing nine arbitrarily. So um, here we have a large debate over the function of these shore forts um, that you can see here in my map in blue and uh, major Roman sites in red triangles. Um, so during archaeological excavation, there's been an evidence of varied activities outside of typical military um, find assemblage patterns. So you have evidence of animal processing, live animal transport and keeping, leatherworking, grain storage, and other industrial activity um, that's been found at Brancaster, Burgcastle, Castle, Sea, and Porchester. At Reculver, Dover, and Richborough, you have um, evidence for a wide variety of time periods of occupation. So changes in function may have occurred as well. Um, the wider ceramic and archaeobotanical evidence presents more confirmation that the shore forts were involved in economic endeavors that may have been outside of traditional military organization at the time. So due to this and a politically volatile wider context of the later Roman, Roman Empire, which was one of conquest, reconquest, or patient, intermittent imperial interference, um, the primary function has been ascribed to these shore forts as one of logistics rather than militaristic. However, the scholarship doesn't describe what they mean when they say logistic. Um, so I have devised a definition that I think that we are all sort of circling around. So logistics to me and for the purposes of this study meant um, something that enables the process of coordinating and implementing complex movement of resources. And so ultimately the major aim of this research was to figure out if this ascribed function of logistical was appropriate based on the affordances of the landscape and interior surrounding of the shore forts. Um, so in order to determine if the applicability of this function was reasonable, I examined and tested the shore forts through three categories, accessibility potential, distribution, and the affordance of least effort of movement. So this method was chosen because the Saxon shore forts have never been subjected to a spatial analysis before, and it's also not examined the role of military in economic exchange or how this system, if there is a system, works at all. So additionally, there's been no attempt to use computational modeling either um, to examine these relationships. So lastly, due to the scope of a master's thesis, I examined the distribution between all possible shore forts, but examined the accessibility potential and affordance of least effort between three. Um, the three chosen were at Brancaster, the northernmost shore fort, Porchester, the westernmost shore fort, and Richborough, which is an interposed fort between the two along the Kentish coast. So the software ArcGIS Pro <laughs> was utilized to produce accumulated cost surfaces and least cost pathways, um, which we know there's no one way to actually do. So I'm going to go through some of my um, processes here with you today. Um, digital terrain models, hydrology, roads, and other cultural features were considered when creating this accumulated cost surface. And so let's get into it. 
So ordnance survey terrain maps were downloaded in 10 kilometer tiles in an ASC format through Digimap Adena. And then they were mosaic into a new raster layer by National Grid Squares first for my sanity. And then for the entirety of England, Wales, and just a little bit north of Scotland, 25 kilometers north of Hadrian's Wall, um, because the Antonine Wall by this the Antonine Wall by this period had been largely abandoned. Um, the resolution of 50 meter by 50 meter cells was chosen for a couple different reason reasons. So the main reason was honestly due to the consideration of computational times <laughs> um, and the very very large study area. I also determined that finer resolutions were not really necessary to meet the research goals. Additionally, the DTM is based off of modern topography, and while topography is mainly unchanged from the Roman period on a large scale, finer resolutions and finer details may have been changed due to human activity and erosion. So this formed the basis for my multi-criteria cost service and two more raster layers were combined. I used the Tobler's hiking equation when calculating uh, when calculating the slope. Um, and this is this has been used for quite a long time in archaeological examinations of the cost of movement through a terrain. Um, I then process this equation further into give me, giving me outputs of uh, kilometers per hour and then hours by kilometer so I could track how many minutes it took to, to, to traverse per each square. And that was the scale that I was working in. So I was working in time seen through a, a effort uh, lens. So, um, the other raster layer that was considered, or the other cost was that was considered and combined in a raster layer was hydrology. So hydrology was considered a high effort zone to cross for purposes of, for the purposes of study in most cases. Um, readily available UK hydrology data was downloaded from diva-gis uh, and then projected, oh God, <laughs> and then projected into the British National Grid. However, this data set on its own was not suitable for coastal areas, as many of the polylines terminated prematurely before meeting the coast. And so when I was generating and testing least cost pass, they would sort of wind around rivers and hug the coast. So um, I added, oh, here's an example of that raster layer. Not great. So um, I went in and added a new layer where I added connections as a separate feature layer based off of OS cartographic base maps, combined those polylines, and then created a new raster layer so that um, the least cost pass wouldn't jump around estuaries. And then a secondary consideration for hydrology was road intersections. So this is fun. Can you hear me now? Maybe. Okay. Uh, so the second, the secondary consideration for hydrology was the Roman road network. So waterways were considered um, areas of high effort to cross unless they were intersected by a road. So this rationale was based in the fact that um, if you have a road intersecting a river, you most likely have a bridge or a low effort of um, fording the river there. And additionally, there were over 1,100 instances of these intersections between the hydrology and the bodies of water. Um, so affording the computational model these pathways to take through hydrology would have greatly affected the path in which they could take. Um, and so I combined through conditional um, through conditional phrases through the raster calculator function. I combined all of these together, the intersections, the roads, and the friction surface to create my multi-criteria cost surface, which looked like this. Um, so this was the resulting friction surface, and this is currently at a scale of one to two million. So it's a little hard to see the finer details, but in the small circle in the right-hand corner, you can see a sample terrain at one to 300,000, which kind of shows you a little more detail of the terrain and the cost associated with traveling through it. 
So let's get into the cultural data that I then put into here. So data for the location of this action shore forts comes from Pleiades, um, which I then projected into the British National Grid. <laughs> and then um, data for the um, major towns and urban centers of Roman Britain were from the uh, from Hansen 2016, which is part of the Roman um, the Oxford Roman Economy Project database. And then lastly, uh, location data for the um, rural sites throughout Roman Britain were selected from the Rural Settlement of Br Roman Britain, an online resource, uh, which is made available through the Archaeology Data Service um, as readily available Excel files to download. And so this particular database had just over 3,600 sites, um, which then I used and filtered through to create my own database for the applicable time period being examined. So certain sites like caves and shrines were omitted for the purpose of this study and um, settlements and military sites and industry sites that um, were abandoned in or before 250 CE were largely omitted. And then sites with no reliable dating were wholly excluded. Um, sites that had continued occupation past the Roman legions leaving Roman Britain were still included because they their existing past that time period was largely irrelevant to the parameters of the study. So the date ranges examined were three 50-year periods spanning across the late Roman Empire. Um, and then data... Or, so all of this information was used um, to create uh, these um, friction surfaces and accumulated cost surface maps like these. Um, so you can see three separate sites across three 50-year blocks. And from these maps are where a majority of my statistics come from. And so let's look at one a little more in detail, and I'll tell you how to read them. So... Uh, each one of these bands of color is considered a day or eight hours of travel. So eight hours of continuous walking was considered a day of travel um, in order to account for um, the amount of daylight, um, rest breaks, eating, things like that. And so I examined four different bands, local, non-local, regional, and extra regional. Um, which um, accounted for eight hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, and 32 hours of continuous walking broken up over the appropriate day span. So major and minor site types on these maps could be toggled on and off, as well as the road systems so that you could have a more nuanced understanding of what was happening between days of travel, where the roads are, and where certain sites are. So there are a couple uh, really notable things that I noticed after generating these cost services. And I'm going to just share some of the more interesting ones with you today. Um, so the combined, um, the combined extra regional accessibility uh, covered a huge um, area of England. So it encompassed 50,000 311 square kilometers containing on average across all time periods, 62% of all settlements, uh, military institutions and industry sites in Britain. So overall, there was a low density of sites along the coastline. Um, and But no shore fort was completely a, a devoid of sites in their local areas. Um, so this low local connectivity and um, its combination with a high extra regional accessibility um, may point towards a large scale nodal network um, of the provincial economy, um, particularly with small world connectivity, uh, because once you reach one cluster of sites, you can reach the next usually within a day of travel. And so it sort of spreads out like a fractal. And here on this chart, you can see that sort of fractal pattern going on. You have some sites in the beginning switching, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and so looking at this and thinking about the 
Roman economy during this time in Britain is quite interesting because we usually only have secondary evidence or our evidence comes from the movement of ceramics and um, metalworking and archaeobotanical materials. So there's not a lot of examples of direct um, commenting on purchasing or ordering and things like that. Um, but just having a small glimpse into the processes of these provincial economies um, sort of highlight the fact that this is part of an established network of contacts that's happening. So we have to remember that this provincial economy is in its maturity by this time. So just by looking at the land transport alone, which is what I've done, the ability to access just under two thirds of the entire population within four days of travel sort of affords a higher amount of connectivity than previously thought. Um, and the model travel time does not account for riverine travel, which would have expedited things quite a bit depending on cargo. So some small scale statistics that I thought were interesting. <laughs> um, Braincaster's main industry accessibility was salt. So 46.4% or of all salt production in the province could access Brancaster within four days of walking. Um, and Brancaster overall had really high industry. Uh, Richborough gained accessibility to an urban site within every day of travel west into the interior. So creating sort of this linear node of travel directly into the interior. Um, you see it stops here at Canterbury, Rochester, London, St. Albans. And what's interesting is that this line follows um, quite closely the least cost path analysis that was generated. Lastly, Portchester had the most access potential to villas during their peaks. Um, and during this time, villas are going to be the highest consuming areas of uh, exported and imported materials um, because a lot of the magisterial class had moved to the countryside at this point. So lastly, least cost pathways <laughs> were generated for each shore for under examination. And um, I put a 500 meter buffer zone around these least cost paths and compared them to where the Roman road network was. And there was a very apparent highland and lowland divide which may have had something to do with the type of cost that was prioritized. So in the highlands, you maybe have a more um, emphasis on caloric cost, which is what slope is pretty much based on, versus the lowlands where there may be more incentive to go to um, larger urban centers or market economies to make more money rather than being concerned with your caloric cost. Um, so uh, conclusions. Does the spatial relationship between the Saxon shore forts and the interior facilitate a logistical relationship? Um, I concluded that from a logistics perspective, um, the Saxon shore forts are well distributed along the southeastern coast region in order to support several different types of systems at once. Um, the spread not only enables coastal observation for both piratical um, and legitimate imperial threats during the periods, of usurpation and instability, um, but the distribution also affords a high amount of accessibility into the interior, um, having more than over having more than sixty percent of all settlements um, within the province accessible within four days of walking. And I think that each site may have had different focal points rather than an overall function together as a system. Brancaster, for example, is located quite far north and may have facilitated more travel towards the military sites in the hinterland, whereas um, uh, where we are, whereas Richborough may have had a more hybrid approach to its actual function since it was located quite advantageously on the now extinct Watson Channel. And it's uh, very close to other shore forts as well, much more so than others. And then um, when we look at, oh no, when we look at Corchester, um, it may have had a more uh, passive role since it's in a more protective area of the channel and may have facilitated more um, commercial activity to the higher spending areas of the villas. So um, regardless, all of the shore forts under examination had several affordances that may have equipped each to facilitate slightly different operations. So trying to ascribe one function, um, I think would be unreasonable.
Um, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be around.